So we're very happy to have Mike, Mike Keller come and speak at the Summer Institute for the second time. Um, spent some time in a car with him over the weekend, so I learned a little bit more about his history. He started off in social psychology, then he did a PhD in evolutionary medicine, during which he started trying to understand um, how to reconcile evolutionary hypotheses with the existence of heritable variation from twin studies. And so my understanding is that was his route into BG. And now he runs a very successful lab at the University of Colorado Boulder that routinely puts out important papers in statistical and psychiatric genetics. So probably Matt's most famous paper, uh, I'm sure it will come up today during his talk, is about um, problems with early studies claiming um, to have identified gene by environment interactions. Um, but more recently, he's also done a lot of work with genotype and sequencing data, including a um, um, famous study comparing um, um, different estimators for SNP heritability that have, the study has already, I mentioned it because it's already been mentioned in at least uh, two of the talks, though without explicit, uh, in one case, it might not have been obvious that it was Matt's paper that people were referring to. So we're very happy um, to have uh, Matt here, and the floor is yours. Thank you. All right. Um, so I'll start off by uh, a little plug for two recruitments that we're doing at CU Boulder. So um, spread the word if anybody's looking. So we are recruiting for an assistant professorship. And this can be in many different possible departments, including economics, um, sociology, psych, and neuroscience. Um, you would be at the Institute for B at IBG, the Institute for Behavior Genetics, but you would also have a home department there. So if you are looking for a tenure track uh, home, this might be a place to look. Also, I am recruiting a postdoctoral fellow in my lab, looking for people who are interested in statistical genetics. So um, spread the word. If you know of anybody, if you're interested yourself, go to uh, colorado.edu slash IBG slash positions. Um, so, this is the outline. I don't know how much for sure I get through. Um, so, I'll talk about G by E definitions and motivations for studying gene by environment interactions. Um, talk about two basic types of interactions that we're potentially interested in. Go over notation and then talk about issues of uh, scale in interactions and statistical models, and these are um, not that separate from each other. They're actually uh, they're kind of one and the same. Um, and then proper interpretation of terms uh, in, from those models, uh, how to control for covariates in interaction models. So this is something that is, uh, not done, has not historically been done properly. Um, then talk about issues with candidate gene by environment interaction studies. This is something not specific to G by E, but rather probably to candidate genes themselves. Um, talk a little bit about GWIS, that's genome-wide interaction studies. And then um, talk about polygenic risk by environment. So I'm not really, there, you know, y this could be a week-long thing. I'm going to only cover some of it. So I'm not going to talk about much about Grimmel uh, interaction studies uh, using uh, Grimmel or GCTA or those using LD score. Uh, so first of all, um, some definitions here. So we say that a G by E exists when the risk allele depends, the, or the effect of the risk allele depends on, Tony, good to see you. <laughs> when the effect of the risk allele depends on the level of, of the environment, or equivalently, you could say that the effect of the environment depends on which uh, risk allele you have. So in either case, we say that that is an example of a gene by environment interaction. So why do we care? So I think um, people expect that G by E's are probably fairly common, and I think that's, that's likely to be true myself. I think the, the bigger issue is, is their, their detection. So genes don't exist in a vacuum. Their effects almost certainly depend at some level on the environment that they find themselves in. And understanding those factors is the study of gene by environment interactions. Um, as I said, a lot of people expect that these are ubiquitous. Uh, you know, for a given outcome, if you just define uh, reactions to, the, to environmental factors as itself a phenotype, it would be astonishing if that trait weren't itself heritable. So in other words, we expect that there are, there, there's some heritability in how people react to the environment. And if that's the case, then there should be gene by environment interactions out there. Um, also, I think that the study of this is appealing to people because 
it counters misrepresentations of behavior genetics, that it's um, about genetic determinism, and it suggests ways that we might be able to modify that risk. Um, even if you're born with the risk allele, that there might be ways around that. So, for example, if you have ApoE4, which is the risk allele for Alzheimer's disease, um, there's suggestions in the literature, although I'm not sure that I um, believe it, uh, that that can be modified by um, diet or by exercise. Um, but, as I said, the detection of G by E isn't straightforward. Um, there's a lot of statistical pitfalls, which we'll cover some of those here. Um, there's also a concern that, th that those that exist in the literature now have a very high false positive rate. So, of those published, what proportion are, are true positives? It could be quite low. So, talk about two basic types of um, gene by environment interactions. And uh, there's a lot of ways that people discuss these. I'll use the terms quantitative G by E. This is, you could also call this a heritability by E. This is where the heritability changes across the level of the environment. Um, so, you could model this as the, for each locus across K loci, um, there's some uh, beta effect for that locus, some kind of average effect, um, plus some um, effect that depends on the level of the environment you're on. But importantly here, this beta prime doesn't depend on K. It's not indexed by K. And so, the variance here will change quadratically depending on the level of the environment that you find yourself in. It'll either increase or decrease depending on whether that B prime uh, coefficient is positive. So, um, positive or negative. So, there's, uh, this is often looked at in twin studies using the so-called Purcell model. I think a lot of people have probably heard about the Turkheimer results this, in this workshop. So, this is the idea that the heritability of IQ changes as a, as a function of a, either education or SES, depending on who's looking at it. Um, such that the heritability is lower in high, is that right? Yes, I think that's right. Lower in high SES. Did I get that right? Okay. I can't remember. Um, and then higher and, in, 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 um, yeah, so is, yeah, there I have it. The genetic variance is for IQ is lower at low SES. There's also, you could do this with uh, polygenic risk scores or polygenic scores, PGSs. Um, so, the, whether the R squared or the heritability um, explained by that PGS uh, changes as a function of some environmental risk factor. And there's a paper by uh, Pirut, Pirat, I guess, Vauder, Pirat. I'm not even sure how to say his last name, but he's a, he's a colleague of mine. I'll talk about this. Uh, <laughs> I should know. I'll talk about this more in, in a bit because he uh, subsequently wasn't able to replicate this, this finding, but that, um, that the uh, heritability from a PGS change depending on uh, childhood trauma such that it was, um, the heritability was higher in the trauma exposed group. Um, there's another type of interaction. Uh, this is a qualitative G by E. And this distinction between qualitative and quantitative really um, matters more when we're talking about polygenic methods. For single gene methods, for single polymorphism, it's, it's not possible to differentiate these two. So a qualitative uh, G by E is where the effects are multiplied by different betas uh, at each locus across E. And what this will do is it, it, it can change the uh, genetic variance across levels of E, although that's not guaranteed. Um, but it, what, what it will do is it will change the covariance between individuals depending on the level of the environment. So, um, so for example, we've looked at uh, I, I don't have it up there anymore, actually. So, we've looked at this with respect to schizophrenia across uh, e, where the E variable is ancestry and found a, a genetic correlation um, for schizophrenia of about 0.6 between uh, people of African descent and people of European descent. Um, this is often looked at in candidate gene studies. So, for example, the, the famous CASPI result for the 5-HTTLPR by stressful life events. Um, such that the, uh, uh, that the effect of that allele actually changes across different levels of stressful life events. And in Grimmel or in LD score regression, the prediction would be that the um, SNP correlation changes as a function of different levels of E. Um, so uh, there's this uh, paper by um, Matt Robinson and colleagues uh, that found that the SNP correlation for, for BMI dependent on age, so here we're treating age as in the environmental factor, um, such that uh, if you look at the genetic correlation between the youngest cohort, 18 to, to about 40, and the oldest cohort, uh, that genetic correlation is only about 
And as I said, I think before, maybe it was on Friday, uh, this can roughly be interpreted as, uh, you know, that about 60, if, if in a very simplistic model, about 60% of the genes are shared across uh, old and young cohorts. Now, that, that, of course, doesn't really make sense. It's really 60% of the genetic effects, or simply that the genetic correlation is about 0.6 between young and old. Um, but the, the important thing is that the qualitative interaction is that the effects of these alleles change. That's going to lead to a d decrease in genetic correlation as the people become increasingly dissimilar uh, as a, um, on the environmental variable. So there's different ways that we can get at these uh, quantitative versus qualitative G by E's. Um, you know, for twin studies, uh, it's uh, very common to look at quantitative G by E, look at whether heritability changes, but you could also look at qualitative G by E. This is often done, for example, with respect to, to sex or gender to see if the same, if the quote unquote same genes that affect males uh, for male height also affect female height. That correlation between male and females is, is very, very high, like 0.9. Um, but there are other traits for which the correlation isn't, isn't quite that high between, between genders. Um, you can look at this for single polymorphisms, either one at a time or across the entire genome in a GWIZ G study. Um, um, this typically is focusing on the qualitative interaction. Um, but as I've said before, it's impossible with a single polymorphism to tell the difference between this quantitative and qualitative because a qualitative interaction usually will imply a change in variance across the level of E. Even if there's a perfect uh, crossover, if you've got uh, 0, 1, 2 um, risk alleles, what you would see in this, this case would be higher genetic variation at both of the, uh, heter at the, both of the homozygotes and lower genetic variation at the, homo at the heterozygote. Um, so it typically a qualitative interaction implies a quantitative interaction, so they're not really distinguishable at the single gene level. Um, for polygenic scores, uh, you can test the quantitative interactions by looking at genetic correlations and a qualitative, uh, quantitative interaction um, by, there's not a, 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 wait a minute, I'm getting, okay, sorry, I'm, I was thinking about LD score regression. So for LD score regression in Grimmel, um, the usual uh, emphasis is on qualitative. We can test quantitative interactions, that, whether heritability changes. Um, typically, this is done by stratifying in the level of, of the E. And so there's not a single test that you can do to test for a quantitative G by E in Grimmel or LD score that I'm aware of. We've tried to come up with a method to do this. The person who was leading that effort uh, jumped ship and went to industry. Um, so that, uh, that's kind of foundered that project. But, um, at least with Grimmel, we had found that we had to use uh, nonlinear interactions, which you can't do with GCTA. So we had to write basically our own um, estimator in R, which actually worked fairly okay for, for decent samples. Um, but there's no current way that I'm aware of that you can, that you can test a quantitative interaction with LD score or Grimmel. Rather, people tend to stratify their sample. And then with respect to um, polygenic scores, um, usually the focus of a polygenic score by E interaction is on this quantitative, where the R squared changes. Um, but as I'll show later in this presentation, it's also difficult to distinguish qualitative and quantitative there. and has to do with what your discovery sample is made up of, with, uh, what, or what the distribution of the moderator is in your discovery sample. Uh, I'll get to this later. Um, so. Regression tests the mean, so the single polymorphism and genome-wide interaction studies are what I'm going to focus on mostly uh, here because they're the most common studied and also because the lessons that we can take from the single gene um, by an interaction, single allele or single locus by E interaction studies I think are, are going to apply pretty broadly across a lot of different types of interaction studies. We, could, um, we might look at a lot of different designs we might be interested in. Okay, so first, just some notational issues here. So I'm going to use the CASPI example, not be because I think it's true. In fact, I think it's pretty, uh, I think it's been shown pretty, uh, pretty um, certainly that this is not a real interaction. Um, I'll justify that later on, on the talk. Um, but it is the most cited paper. It has about uh, G by E papers, maybe 9,000 citations. So it's an incredibly cited paper from uh, 2003 which studied the effects of childhood uh, maltreatment um, or stressful life events on, and the 5-HTTLPR repeat polymorphism on depression. 
Um, so in uh, about 850 um, young adults, they found this marginally significant effect of 5-HTTLPR, so it was p-value 0.06. Um, but the more important thing was that it looked like the effect of that allele depended on maltreatment. So here I've broken it up just so that we've got the, uh, the protective allele and the risk allele, the short repeat, um, rather than having the heterozygote here just because it simplifies everything for our purposes. It doesn't matter much. Um, and so the probabilities of, of depression um, were, looked like this. So if you had the, the long repeat polymorphism, it really didn't matter whether you had no maltreatment or maltreatment. The effects, your probability of, of getting depression were about the same. Um, however, if you had the short allele, um, if you had no maltreatment, it was looked about like the baseline. But if you had the combination of both the short allele and maltreatment, you had this very large increase of uh, risk for depression. So the joint effect of the, of the short allele and maltreatment was where all the action was. Um, So we could also, instead of putting in the absolute probabilities here, we could just talk about the relative risk of this. So if we use this as the, as the baseline risk, 0.3, we could ask what are the rel risk relative to that base baseline. That's what I have here. So obviously it's 1.0 by definition in, the, in this cell. We'll call that P00. In the maltreatment with the non-risk allele, it's 1.03. It's about 3% larger, which is not statistically significant. It's the same in the uh, risk allele with no maltreatment. But the risk is twofold, or 2.1-fold, if you have both the maltreatment and, um, and the risk allele. So it looks like the effect of 5-HTTLPR depends on maltreatment. It's important to note that you could also say the same thing, that the, uh, that the effect of maltreatment depends on 5-HTTLPR. And when bo one has both the risk allele and maltreatment, your risk doubles for depression. So that's an example of a G by E interaction. So I'll call G the genetic polymorphism, E the environmental mo moderator, Y the outcome. And for simplicity, we're just going to assume that G, E, and Y are all binary here. Um, so E will being zero for low risk, one for high risk, G being zero for the low, for the protective allele, and one for the high, the high risk allele. And we'll let PGE be the probability that Y is one, um, given both G and E. So P00 will be uh, the reference probability. This is where you have neither risk factor. And P11 is where you have both. P01 is where you have the environmental risk factor, but not the genetic risk factor. And P10, where you have the genetic risk factor, not the environmental one. Yeah? Well, my question relates to the conversation we had a few days back about the definition of environment. It seems there's no like unified definition, but my question is, does it usually include the physiological environment within the body once we transcend the cell, or it's usually the environment, the outer environment, once we transcend the body? I think it could be either one. I think it depends how you want to think about it. I think chip typically people are looking at things out external to the body, but it certainly could be. And the other issue I think that your question raises is about whether these environmental factors themselves are heritable. And if they are, it's always possible that when we're looking at a, what we think is a G by E could actually be a G by G interaction. And that's always going to be the case when you have correlated, you know, uh, correlated risk factors. You're not sure exactly what it is that's causing that. We'll, we'll actually get to this a little bit, this issue of uh, when we talk about con controlling for covariates in, in G by E. Any other questions about the notation? Okay, so let's talk about issues of scale and additive versus uh, multiplicative interactions. So here's the same setup um, that we talked about a second ago. There's really two basic ways of thinking about um, joint effects when it comes to binary outcomes. Um, so we can talk, think about either an additive model or a multiplicative model. And it actually becomes quite important. This, the same issue applies when you have uh, continuous outcomes on Y. But it's much, I think it's easier to see it with, um, with uh, binary outcomes. A lot of the how I cover this is covered, or, or the way that I'm covered is guided by this paper by um, Vanderweel and Noel from 2014. 
And so I encourage people to read that paper. Um, a lot of how I cover this issue of scale comes from this. So under the additive null, where we don't think that there's any joint, there's anything special about the synergistic effect between G and E, then we're going to say simply that the excess risk due to both G and E together is simply equal to the sum of those two effects, okay? so the, the addition of those two effects. So we would say that the, the excess risk of G and E would be the probability of the joint effect minus the reference. That's the effect of the joint, the two together. And under the null, that should be equal to the effect of just the, um, just the effect of the gene, which is P10 minus P00. That's the effect of just the gene controlling for environment. And this is the effect of just the environment controlling for the gene, holding gene constant at zero. So P01 minus P00. So under the null, under the additive model, that should hold, right? The, the joint effect should equal the sum of those two um, effects of G and E. Under a multiplicative null, it's that the excess risk of G and E is equal to the effect of G multiplied by the effect of E. Here we're talking about, in the top one, we're talking about absolute risk. On the bottom one, we're talking about changes in proportionate risk, whether you're, it's, it's, you're getting an increase of you know, three percentage points in the top versus an increase in, uh, in, uh, in multiplying the risk by 1.3, 30% increase. Right? So here we're saying the, the excess risk of G and E is the probability of one of the joint effect divided by the, the base, right, the reference cell, P11 over P00, should equal the, just the effect of G, which is the effect P10 divided by the, the base, multiplied by the effect of E, P01 divided by the base. All right, so this might be clear if we look at a, an example. So I'll have two of these. So one of them out of the one on the multiplicative scale, both using the Caspi results. Um, so these again are the probabilities uh, that Caspi observed in his uh, in his study. So on the additive scale, interactions measure the extent to which the effects of the two factors combined um, exceed the sum of the individual effects. Okay. So here we would say that the effect of the interaction minus the effect of just the gene, my, pl plus the, minus this as well, because this is all together, is going to be equal to P11 minus P10 minus P01 plus P00. This is the effect of, this is the interaction effect. All right? If we see that this is, right, if this is, if this is so if this equals this, right, there would be no interaction. This would equal zero, we'd say that there's no interaction. If this right here, the joint effect, is greater than what we expect based on the sum of the genetic and the environmental effects, we'd say that there's a positive interaction, right? P, this quantity is greater than zero, so there's a positive interaction. The, the, the effect of the joint, the joint effect is greater than what you would expect based on just the effect of gene and just the effect of the environment added together, all right? If this is negative, I mean, sorry, if the P11 minus P10 minus P01 plus P00 is less than zero, we say the interaction is negative, that the effect of G and E jointly are less than what you would expect based on both of the two effects taken individually. So in this case, right, we've got 0.64 plus 0.3, 0.94 minus 0.3 minus 0.31, we have an, uh, uh, an estimate of the interaction effect of 0.33 on the additive scale. This is positive. So we'd say here that the two risk factors combined have a larger effect than expected based on the sum of the two G and E effects. Okay. On the additive scale, this is, this is a, a positive interaction. The same thing happens uh, on the multiplicative scale in this case. So here, um, we're going to talk about risk ratios. The risk ratio for the joint effect is P11 divided by the, the, the um, reference cell, right, where there's no, in, where there's no uh, risk factors at all. So this is uh, about 2.1 fold greater risk for depression in this, in this cell, right, relative to the base. And how does that compare to what we expect the effect to be if, we're, if the risks are, are being multiplied? Well, the way we would get this, we did the risk ratio for just the genes, which is one, it's no, no increase in risk, it's exactly the same. 
The risk effect for just the environment is just 3% greater, and a measure of the interaction effect on the multiplicative scale is to take this risk ratio, 1, 1, and divide it by the product of the two other risk ratios, right? Risk ratio 1, 0 multiplied by risk rate ratio 0, 1. And that, if you do some math, that actually is the same thing as uh, P11 times P00 divided by P10 times P01. Okay. And this is just, uh, the math is, I think, pretty obvious, right? If you take this and you divide it by this times this, the P00s, two of the P00s go up, they cancel out, one of the P00s cancels out, so it's P11 multiplied by P00 divided by P01 times P10. This is, a, this is an estimate of the effect of the interaction on the multiplicative scale now. If we think that risks combine multiplicatively, that it's a, that it's, um, a proportionate increase. And under this scale, and the multiplicative scale, it once again, is a positive interaction. So 2.06 is greater than 1. Uh, we say this is a positive interaction, that these combine synergistically, that the effect of G and E together is more than we would have expected based on just the effect of G or the, and the effect of E combined. So people often talk about the dependency or the dependency of interactions on scale, on the scale, typically on the scale of Y. Um, but it's often not uh, realized that how you decide to model the interaction is also an issue of scale, about whether we're going to be modeling this on a multiplicative in a multiplicative or in an additive way. And depending on that definition, uh, or depending on the decision that we make about how to do this, we uh, implicitly change the scale of y and can change evidence for interactions. Um, so for example, if we decide to model this, this particular is a different set of made up um, probabilities here. If we decided to model this as being a, an additive scale. Um, well, the effect here is 0.38. And that's much bigger than the, the sum of this 0.08 and 0.13, right? So at the additive scale, this looks like a positive interaction, right? The effects of G and E together look a lot bigger than they would be expected just based on the additive effect of G and the additive effect of, of E. They combine in a, in a way that's non-additive. Yep? I was just wondering if uh, the fact that you're already formulating this as an additive problem, wouldn't that automatically set that the best criteria is itself additive because you're essentially saying that you have this G by E interaction term that's sort of contributing an additive term to the phenotypic value. Mm -hmm. So unless you take like the logarithm or something of it, then it should, you would probably stick to the, based on the, just the additive nature of, of the phenotypic. Yeah, so I mean, hold off that question one sec because we're going to talk about when you transform log take the log of y, how that will actually change what we mean. It's actually not additive anymore. It's multiplicative. Right. Okay? Yeah. 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 So the multiplicative, in this case, we take the P11 multiplied by P00 and divide it by the product of the other off diagonals. And we get an uh, effect of the interaction of 0.53, which is less than 1. So we actually have a, an opposite conclusion on the, on the multiplicative scale. Here we say that the joint effect of G and E is less than we would have expected. And this can be seen, right, that this, this is about a 20-fold increase in risk, right? And it's 20, is 20 fold bigger than we'd expect? Well, this is a five-fold increase, and that's about a seven and a half fold increase. Where right? seven and a half times five is about thirty-eight or something. Well, thirty-eight is a lot bigger than twenty, right? So we have that the joint effects now are less than would be expected based on the two marginal effects. So those are extreme examples. Uh, OK, whoops, I didn't realize. OK, so here's an example of the opposite, where the reverse can occur. So here is on the additive, we have, for these set of numbers, a negative interaction. Okay, But on the multiplicative scale, we have a positive interaction. All right. So, so just changing the scale or how we actually model this can change our, our decision about whether an interaction exists or doesn't exist. Um, now, these two examples I've showed are pretty extreme examples, usually, but not always. Um, the direction of the interaction is the same between the multiplicative and the additive scale. 
um, but it's quite easy for significances to change, all right? And this is not, this should make people uncomfortable, right? Because often for, in behavioral traits, um, the scale on which we're measuring something is fairly arbitrary. We're not sure what the right scale is. And so if it's a binary, we just kind of knee-jerk use a logistic regression. That's a multiplicative model. If it's continuous, we kind of knee-jerk use a, just the untransformed y. That's an additive model. Um, but there's nothing to say that we shouldn't be using log y in the case of the continuous measure. There's nothing to say that we shouldn't just be modeling with ordinary least squares on 0, 1 and modeling the probabilities if it's binary. And that, that arbitrary decision about how we model can, very, can change their, the conclusions that we have about these interactions. So the question is, which of those scales is best? Should we be um, doing this on an additive scale? Or should we be looking at interactions on a multiplicative scale? Um, so this is a long debate in, the, in statistics. It's not clear that there is one right answer. Um, I think most people who really look into this uh, tend to think that the additive scale is the one that should be used. I'm not sure I completely agree, so let me walk through a little bit of my, my thinking. Um, so, so the general conclusion from the literature is that the additive scale is of greater public health relevance. Um, you know, people don't often care whether something increases their risk by 20%. They want to know what the actual probability of getting disease X is. And if what you're concerned about is absolute probabilities, you should be looking at the additive scale. Um, so this allows one, the additive scale allows one to discern which subgroup would benefit most from uh, an intervention, from adding or removing a moderator. I'll give an, a, an example of that in a second. Um, but the multiplicative scale corresponds most closely to modeling interactions on the liability. That's often what we're interested in when we're, um, when we're doing uh, um, genetic studies, we, we make some assumption that there's some underlying normal liability. And if you're doing logistic regression, it's not exactly modeling on the liability. If you wanted to do that, you'd want to use what's called a probit model. Um, but the logistic model and the probit model tend to agree almost exactly until you get to the extremes of the probability distribution. And so probably logistic models are much closer to what we think of when we're talking about um, heritability, for example, on a liability scale. And most control, case control studies do use logistic reg regression, which is a multiplicative scale for binary outcomes. Um, so my suggestion is that it's probably wise, although almost never done, um, to report the results of your interaction on both scales, both, uh, both the uh, multiplicative and the additive scale. I'll go over how to do that in just a second. Um, and then so to, to, to do this, uh, I guess I'll tell you now, um, to do this, you would just simply perform uh, uh, for if you have a binary outcome, um, you would perform either logistic regression, that would correspond to a multiplicative uh, um, test of the interaction, or just perform ordinary least squares on this zero one outcome, that would correspond to uh, looking at this on the additive scale. Um, for uh, continuous outcomes, we could just look at log y or y, that log y will give us the multiplicative interactions. Uh, we'll test the multiplicative action, and, and just why we'll test the additive. Uh, there's a knee-jerk uh, reaction to against um, um, using uh, ordinary least squares uh, and treating y as though it were continuous um, when, it's, when it's actually truly binary, 1, 0. Um, there's, a, there's an interesting, uh, interesting paper on this by Helovic in 2009. Um, you know, it really, once your sample size is big enough, now, obviously, the residuals are never going to be close to normal, regardless of the sample size. But the distribution of residuals itself isn't what's crucial. What's crucial is the distribution of the betas. And as your sample size gets big, by the central limit theorem, those betas will become normally distributed, and, and uh, the, those betas divided by their standard error, their estimated standard error, will become t-distributed. So once your sample size, even over about 100, you're probably perfectly fine with respect to proper type 1 error rates for using just ordinary least squares on 0, 1 outcomes. Um, so I don't think there's, uh, the, you know, the real problem, right, with using OLS and binary outcomes is, is, in, is in prediction. You can very easily get predictions that are outside the bound of 0 or 1, um, but if you're not worried about prediction, uh, I think it's fine to just use ordinary least squares on, um, on 0, 1 outcome. Yep. Yeah. There's a lot more possible scales than just ones underlying the additive and multiplicative model. So it seems, I mean, it seems like really the answer, the fundamental answer has to be like 
define your outcome on some scale that has an anticipation. Yes, that's a great point. So th there's an infinite number of possible um, of, uh, possible uh, transformations you could make on Y. That, and uh, you know, some people uh, recommend that the goal should be to, trans to transform away interactions to keep it simple. So it's just simply additive. And so you keep looking through different interactions, regard I mean, in different transformations, regardless of how complicated they are until the interaction disappears. I personally don't think that's the right way to go, and I kind of agree with what you just said. I think what probably we should do is use the scale that we think is most interpretable, and if an interaction exists on that scale, say that there's an interaction on that scale, just realize that interactions aren't something inherent, that it really is about the choice of model that we've used. And so interactions are departures from additivity on the scale that we actually decided to use. There's another one last uh, thing, and, and that is that there are types of interactions that cannot disappear by transformations of scale. These are called uh, disordinal interactions or non-transferable, non-transformable interactions or crossover interactions. The, ter the term is hard because whether an interaction is crossover or not depends on how you decide to, to, to graph it. An interaction that looks like that may look like this when you, when you decide to, to graph it in a, in a different way where instead of it being you know, the genotype here, genotype is here. Um, so whether, so I wouldn't just rely on looking just at the crossover to see whether it can, it can disappear. Um, but I do think that regardless, it's, it's hard to know whether, how risks combine, right? And so I think it's important to go ahead and do it in the two most obvious transformations. Um, because right now what's happening is people, when it's binary, only use a multiplicative scale and when it's continuous, only use an additive scale. And that just, there's this real weird disconnect, and that, that can, I think, lead to, 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 to confusion. For example, you measure in major depression using the CESD, and you get one set of results, and you, use it, you do it looking at uh, diagnosis of depression, you get another set of results. Well, the reason that could be happening is because of differences of how you're, you're um, modeling the interaction. Yeah, Miles. So your, your public health way of doing it does it does give a meaningful scale, and so what you were talking about is on the assumption that it's equally bad if you have the disease. So if you, uh, you know, so something might be binary in the data, but if if somehow there's there's more severe and less severe versions of the disease, then you'd have to do it more com in a more complicated way. If there's really only one severity of the disease, then then that additive scale really is the correct scale because you've only got two two levels of utility and you're just counting up how much of the if you I think if your goal is public health relevance I guess if it's trying to if it's some kind of mechanistic understanding you might be concerned might want to understand the li what's going on at the liability level well well that you know, I mean that kind of goes to to modeling I mean so if if things really are multiplicative it it still has the same so suppose they're multiplicative and there's no interaction in the multiplicative. It has exactly the same public health implications that you should you should worry about the environment more for the people who had a higher liability to begin with. Mm -hmm. But you might think that this is a totally natural mechanism. So there's so there's are we is is there a mechanism other than the kind of mechanism we expect? But even the mechanism that we expect under that multiplicative null still has their interesting public health implications. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, I agree. Was there another question or comment? All right. So this gets actually, I think, to your your point, Miles. So um, so why is it that the additive scale is said to have more public health relevance? So this is again made up data. So suppose that. So suppose we have just uh, um, schizophrenia cases. This is case-only interaction study. So um, we have a potential uh, moderator for um, symptoms, which is either you um, don't get the, the drug or you do. And what we're showing here is the proportion of people who have schizophrenia who have complete remission of, of symptoms. Um, and so you say, look, we've got uh, you know, 1,000 people with this genotype and 1,000 people with this other genotype, and we have only 1,000 doses of this medication, 
um, should we give it to the people with the genotype zero or should we give it to the people with genotype uh, of one? And so uh, that one way to answer that might be to look uh, at an interaction to say, well, look, if the joint effect of having um, this genotype G equal one and getting the drug E equal one is greater than we'd expect, is more positive than we expect based on the marginal effects, we should give the drug to G equal one. And if it's less than we would expect based on the, the marginal effects of G and E, we should give the drug G equals zero. Um, so under, with these numbers here, you get opposite conclusions about how that interaction should work. Under the additive model, um, we have a positive interaction, right? The difference between 0.4 and 0.02 is 0.38, which is a lot greater than 0.08 plus 0.13, right? So we have a positive interaction of 0.17, interaction effect of 0.17, we should give the drug to G equal one, to the group who has the um, one genotype. Uh, but on the mul multiplicative model, it, we come to the opposite conclusion as we saw a second ago, right? The, we have a 20-fold increased risk uh, for the joint, which is less than um, you know, five times seven and a half. Um, so we have a negative uh, interaction here. Um, we should, in this case, give the drug to G equals zero. Um, but if you think about what the actual, rather than just uh, proportionate increases, if you think about the absolute number of patients that are helped, which I think most people would argue is of greater public health relevance, if you give the drug to G equals zero, right, if this is the group that gets the drug, then, um, you know, 10% times 1,000 will have no case, no, will have remission, plus, uh, you know, G equal one doesn't get the drug, 1,000 times 0.1, 0.15, we have 250 uh, cures and remissions. Uh, on the other hand, if you give, the, as the additive suggested, give the drug to G equal one, then we have uh, 1,000 times 0.4, 400, who uh, are cured plus, uh, plus 20 that are, uh, that are in remission in the G equals zero group. We have 420 cures in remission. So when you think about it in absolute numbers, it seems obvious that we should be giving the drug uh, to G equal one which was correctly identified using the additive scale, but incorrectly identified using the multiplicative scale. Are you going to give an example of when the multiplicative scale is the right thing? Because I can only think of examples where we care about the additive scale. Um, am I going to? Well, I think, I'm, I can't remember if I talk more about it, because I'm, I'm, I, we're almost done with the scale stuff, but I think it is important. But, um, I mean, I think that, I think that if, if you, you know, if you're interested in liability, it probably makes more sense to be modeling because that's what the logistic corresponds most closely to. If you're interested in about effects on the li underlying liability of schizophrenia or depression, you should be modeling that uh, on the logistic or the probit, with a probit model. And so that's a multi those are both multiplicative models of risk. Um, if you're interested in just whether or not you have schizophrenia and the, and the absolute numbers of cases or number of cases versus controls, then you would want to do it on the additive model. Does that make sense? Well, I just, I'm trying to think of why I care about liability, um, um, just practically. Yeah. Um, I, I, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Let me tell you something about specific types of <coughs> biological mechanisms. So suppose you think it's an ordinary biological mechanism if it's multiplicative and it's an unusual biological mechanism if it's not multiplicative. That it might be a clue that way. And that's not as directly meaningful as the public health stuff, but it could lead you in a different direction to what your next bit of research is. Mm -hmm. That's a good question. Any thoughts, any other thoughts? I mean, I'll think about it too as I go through. So Patrick, was your question, why would you care about an interaction on the latent variable? Yeah. So one answer might be, if the latent, so for something like depression, for example, I think it's actually useful to know where somebody is on the latent variable. Um, we, we, like, we impose a cutoff when we say, if you're to the right, you're depressed, but mm -hmm. that's not clear to me. If I, that may be correct for some diseases, right? But it really is the case you cross the threshold and then something terrible happens. Mm -hmm. For depression, it seems pretty arbitrary. So there yep. may be that the 
data and variable is actually it's what we care about more. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good point. Yeah. then we're saying that somebody who's in the 20th percentile and goes to the 50th percentile are still going to be healthier in some sense. So it's not, it's not that we care about the... It, the issue is that we don't have a measure of the thing that we're interested yeah, in. Yeah, so in those cases, but, yes. but that's a little bit like saying the binary measure was wrong in yes. the first place. Yeah, yeah, exactly. exactly what it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, and then, and then, and then you want to know. You then, then you have a difficult question of how bad is bad. So that the latent variable that shows up in a logit may not be a good measure of how horrible things are. Even if you imagine how horrible yeah. things are yeah. as being monotonic in the latent variable. It might be a transformation. So we're still like, we're additive, and like we, we we still care about the additive model, but just of a variable that we can't see. Like that's the yeah yeah that that's yeah. a great yeah anyway that's a great um, point, David. I that's why I like uh, coming and teaching here. So I feel like I learn as much as um, yeah. But this I think that's that's exactly so right. Reasons, this may not be true. Now you can see that if I'm the 50th percentile of schizophrenia, I have it doesn't make any difference between 50th and 70th. Yeah. Now it may though. I mean, this is the issue. So you care about the additive model for utility, and so if you don't have, and 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 again, that's that's assuming you're not worrying about inequality but being utilitarian. But you care about the additive model for utility, and there's no particular reason why utility would be exactly the latent variable, though it might be. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm going to talk about the different models and interpretation of terms. This does wrap back. This does circle back to this issue of uh, scale again, and then we'll move on. Um, so, typically, when we model an interaction, uh, we just take the with linear regression. Right? It's the normal intercept plus the effect beta one times or beta g times the effect of the genotype, beta e times the effect of e, um, plus beta i um, times the product of those two, g t multiplied by e. When you do it, when you um, do your regression in this way, beta i is the test of the interaction, whether beta i is different from zero. And so here, ge is the product of ge. This should be beta i is the test of the bilinear interaction. Um, and the interpretation of that, it has a direct interpretation. It's the increase of the slope of e for every one increase in g. Um, on alternatively, it also can be thought of as the increase in the slope of g for every one increase in e. Right? That's how we interpret this interaction term. And to see that, just do simple rearrangement of terms. Here we'll take the, these two terms and put them together and take e to the outside. Right? So this is just um, beta naught plus beta g multiplied by g uh, plus beta e plus beta i g right? multiplied by e. So we can call this term right here beta star e. Right? You can think of this as the conditional slope of e depending on the level of g that you are. Um, so for every one increase in g, beta e, or beta star, is going to increase by beta e, or I'm sorry, is going to increase by beta i. Okay? And its actual slope will be beta e plus beta i for every one increase in g. Um, and you can do similarly similar thing for g. Um, so this is uh, an important point, actually. So um, note that when g here is 0, that beta star e is just equal to beta e. Okay? In a sense, this beta e is kind of like an intercept-like term on the slope of beta star e. Right? It's, the, it's the anchor point for beta star e that's then moderated by g. Um, so when g is 0, we're at that intercept level of beta e. All right? So in other words, the way that we should interpret simple effects in an interaction model, in this case beta e, is it's the predicted slope when the other variable is 0. Okay? So in this case, beta e in this model, right? beta e in this model is the predicted slope, the predicted effect of e when g is 0. Right? And similarly, the beta g here is the predicted slope of g when e is 0. Okay? So it becomes crucial to um, be aware of and to report how you've coded G and E in an interaction model. All right? So in particular, a lot of people say that what you should do is to, when you want, if you want to interpret a simple effect in the context of an interaction, mm -hmm. 
is to center all your variables. And the reason they say that is because it now makes those simple effects interpreted as the predicted slope of each of those effects at the mean level of every other effect, uh, mean level of every other, every other variable, sorry. Okay? An alternative to that, if you're interested in simple effects, is simply to omit the interaction term and to interpret just the simple effects in that model and then include the interaction term, but don't worry about the simple effects in that, in that model. If you have, uh, if you have um, G and E variables that are, that are not centered, and especially if the means are very far away from zero, those simple effect terms can really explode in either negative or positive directions and really should not be interpreted unless you know what you're doing and there's a, there's a good reason to do it. So, uh, for example, if E is age, uh, beta G, age is untransformed here, um, then the effect of beta G in that model would be the predicted effect at birth when age is equal to zero. All right? Um, if you do mean, if you do center mean, uh, if you do mean center E, then the BG will now change to be the genetic effect, the predicted genetic effect at the average level of E. So it's, I guess, long and short is just to be aware of interpreting simple effects and in interaction models. And um, to do that, you want to either mean, mean center those or, um, or interpret them in a model that doesn't contain the interaction. Any questions about that? So is it mechanically the same to do the simple model without interactions as what, what you get when you mean center them? It almost is. It's very close to being the same. It's not, mechan it's not mechanically the same. I think you've got to worry a little bit about some multicollinearity. But it, for practical purposes, it, you get almost the same answer when you do those two things. Yeah. You mean stratifying, or what do you mean by not? You would just literally drop out the product, the G, G by E. Well, if you want to interpret simple effects, one way to do it would just not to include the G by E, and then just look at the effect beta, beta G and beta E in a model that doesn't contain the interaction. Then you could then add the interaction and then interpret beta I from that model, but don't worry about beta G or beta E in that model. And then you don't have to worry about centering. Um, but what is frustrating here is that uh, in the literature, if you you know, I've done a lot of reading of G by E studies over the years for papers that we've written, and um, very often people don't report what the scale is of those, and then they will then interpret those. By the way, the, the interpret the simple effects, and you have no clue what that means. Um, by the way, the same issue happens with, uh, with higher order interactions. So if you've got a, a three-way interaction, um, then all the two-way interactions become conditional predicted interactions at the zero level of the emitted variable, which gets very, very confusing. Um, so I, I would recommend for, if you're going to include a three-way interaction, first just interpret the two-way interactions in models that don't con contain G by E by X, and then have a n another model that has the G by E by X term and just interpret that term alone. Yeah. What, how do you feel about stratifying? So if yeah. Of doing the okay, that's a good question. So, what about stratifying as opposed to doing the, um, including the uh, product term? So, the real issue is, I, I mean, I'm sure that there's other issues I haven't thought of, but I think the real issue is statistical power. So, you're gonna have a lot more power when you combine the sample together and test the product term, rather, as opposed to stratifying in two smaller samples. Uh, you also have to worry about how to get uh, a test of statistical significance from two different uh, from two different betas in the two different samples. So you've got to that could be complicated. For independent estimates, you could just take the difference and do like a difference in means, right? Okay. Surely you have a lot lower power than I. Yeah, it's weird though because I found sometimes that I because I've done a lot of test tubes that uh, that sometimes you find an effect when you stratify and not when you them all together because I, I have the same intuition about the power issue, but sometimes it seems like it's almost you need more power to detect the interaction, mm -hmm. even when you're putting it all together. Then that's it interesting. Just, well, well, one thing is the binary if you have binary variables, then estimating them to separately is absolutely mechanically equivalent to if you have right. interactions right. on right. everything. So the intuition that there's Less power than in the interaction model isn't quite true. If you hmm. have if you have a restriction, so you're you're imposing that the interactions work uh, 
in a certain way, then you've got more power. But if you have separate interactions on everything, it's literally equivalent to doing doing it separately on the two different samples. So it's neither more nor less uh, powerful. So, so splitting the sample is not, is not terrible if, it, in fact, it's not terrible at all. It's the appropriate and easy thing if you thought there should be an interaction on everything in sight if you were doing it all. By together. everything in sight here, we're just talking about G by E, right, in this mm -hmm. case. Well, I mean everything that you're everything that you're looking at. But I mean yeah. there, there are only so many things in play. But when I say yeah. everything in sight, I mean all the things that you've got in your regression. If you were going to do separate interactions yeah. on everything you had in the regression, then it's absolutely hmm. and the power the is same. is the same, same. between us. Absolutely the same. It's not, it's not just, of huh. it's literally I find it surprising. Point. So David, you're shaking your head yes. No, no, so I, I, I trust what Miles says is true. There's an important caveat, which is uh -huh. you have, have a bunch of covariates, so maybe right. you're only like your e conditional on a bunch of things. Yeah. You need to interact your um, yeah. group so, indicator yeah. with each one of those. Yeah, if so you have five groups, you need five interaction terms. Yeah, if all your control so, things but yes, you're willing to restrict that they have the same effect on both samples, now you've got extra power. Mm -hmm. But, but sure. it's extra power conditional on that being true, that, they should, they, that the control variables have the same effect. I mean, whenever you put more structure, if the structure is true, you get more power. Mm -hmm. And so... So, and so that's the real question, is whether the structure is true. But if you put no, no extra structure, put no extra restrictions, then it's just literally equivalent. Okay. But, but you can control for the, uh, for the interaction between the environments and the covariates. Or you, you, the I think you could. If you stratify. You could, by just including the covariates as main effects in the two stratified samples. Right, which no, is it. That wouldn't, I don't think that would control for the interaction between, like suppose you stratify by environment. And suppose you suspect the interaction between the gene and the and the confounder. Yeah. Then you are like you have a paper on this actually. Right, I know, I know I do. <laughs> if you were but supposed but, to but I think I actually do think that, that controlling for the main effect in the stratified sample does equivalently the same thing because you're allowing that covariate to differ across the two different subsamples, right? So that's the same thing as including a covariate by you know stratif stratification interaction or E interaction. You see what I'm saying? The covariate's not you're, not, you're not forcing the covariate effect to be the same between the stratified samples. So I think it actually is, yeah. that's kosher. If, if you thought the right thing was that you were worried that the control variables, the ones in the background that are not G and E, yeah. if you thought the control variables, you, you were worried that they had a different effect in, in the, you know, for men and women, let's say, yeah. then stratifying the sample is exactly the right thing. If, mm. however, you thought the control variable, Not really. you felt that that control variable ought to have the same effect for men and women, then you don't want to well, stratify yeah. the sample. You want we to should, we should let Matt yeah. just go on since there's you know, a lot more to... <laughs> a lot, lot more. But, um, no, Miles, you're, you make a, a good point, but I am going to cover it. And what time is this over, by the way? So, uh, five, like ten? Fifteen minutes. It's over in fifteen minutes? Yeah. Holy <laughs> shit. No more from you, Miles. <laughs> really? So what, what time did I start? Uh, well, we started at 3.35. Oh, wow. Okay. So you should let me something a little longer. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, well, I, I don't want to do that. I think people are, are tired. But um, let, let me, I'm going to just kind of get through some of this stuff, and I won't get through it all. Um, okay. So, uh, so going back to this, uh, this, uh, this issue of scale, um, to do the regression on the additive scale, uh, this is how we interpret the different um, betas from simply using ordinary least squares and treating the zero one as if it's a, a continuous outcome. Beta i is, is equal to exactly what we want it to be, and there's a derivation of that. And on, um, so for in this example, we would get these estimates from just doing OLS on the, uh, on the zero one outcome. And on the multiplicative scale, uh, we could um, use what's called a log linear regression. We just take the log, or we, we model it. The link function would be the log. We don't literally take the log. If you take the log of zero, you don't get anything, get negative infinity. But um, we use a, link func a log link function, and this becomes a log linear regression model. And if you do this, um, the exponent of beta naught is equal to P00. The exponent of beta G is equal to the risk ratio of 1, 0. Uh, the exponent of one zero is equal to risk, or zero one is equal to risk ratio of zero one, and the exponent of the interaction beta is equal to exactly what we want it to be, yeah. risk ratio of one one divided by the product of the other two uh, simple effect risk ratios. 
So beta i in this case tests the interaction on the risk ratio multiplicative scale discussed above, and it arises from models uh, on transform probabilities. Um, we could also use the logistic model. This is almost the same, except now the betas. Uh, so what we're doing was we're doing a logit link function. And so this is uh, the log of the odds. And the odds uh, for P00, for example, is not just log P00. It's log P00 divided by 1 minus P00. So it's the odds that we're now um, modeling. And if we do this, the exponent of beta naught is equal to the odds of the reference P00 over 1 minus P00. And the exponent of these others are equal to exactly analogous to what we had before, except they're not odds ratios. Um, and this is pretty much the standard when people model uh, dichotomous outcomes. Um, so talk about proper control of covariates. And it gets to the point that um, Miles was bringing up and why I um, disagreed somewhat that, it is that the, the best way to do it would be to, to, to stratify and control for the covariates independently. So, um, in genetic epidemiology, we're often concerned about the potential for confounders uh, on a genetic association. Um, and the same thing should be a concern in G by E research. Um, so if we, the, the, the problem is that an observed G by E effect could be due to unmeasured uh, confounders in the same way that the same thing could happen for main effects. But it's the case that in almost all cases that covariates are modeled incorrectly in G by E research is starting to change. But even now, most of the publications coming out aren't, aren't properly controlling for covariates. And that can lead to incorrect inference. So if we let C be the covariate that we wish to control for, the usual way, but the incorrect way that people do this is just to include these covariates as main effects. Um, the actual proper way in order to control for the effect those covariates might have on the interactions and on the interaction itself is to include the covariate by G interaction, in this case, as well as the covariate by um, E interaction. And if both of those interactions are included in the model, we properly control for the effect of the, that those covariates might have on the interaction term. So just an example, if we say that C dummy codes uh, African versus European ancestry, and what we're interested in is whether Alzheimer's disease is affected by APOE variant um, carbohydrate intake, which is the E variable here, and the interaction between those. So does, um, uh, you know, does, does the effect of carbohydrate intake depend on um, APOE with respect to Alzheimer's disease? That's what we're interested in. And we want to control for ancestry because we have a mixed ancestry sample, say. Um, well, if it turns out that, well, it actually is true that, that the E4, the risk allele, is more common in individuals of African descent. Um, and if the effect of carb intake on Alzheimer's disease is different for people of African versus European descent, Right? So in other words, if there's truly uh, an African descent by carb intake interaction, then the, what it looks like a G by E interaction could actually just be an ancestry by E interaction. Um, so similarly, the same thing happens if, you know, say, people from African descent eat, doesn't matter if it's more or less, but say more carbs, carbohydrates, and the, the effect of Alzheimer's or of um, of the E4 allele on Alzheimer's disease risk is different between individuals of African descent and European descent, then the apparent G by E that you observe could actually just be a G by ancestry effect. And both of those scenarios that I've described here, and these aren't completely implausible things that could happen, are properly controlled if you include those uh, product terms in the, in the model, the covariate by G and the covariate by E. So here's just a, a quick confounding example interaction. So say in, in, in real life, uh, what, what, what's actually going on is that uh, the effect of carb intake depends on, on your ancestry, right? So for individuals of African descent, um, that there's a big increase in risk as you, have, as you eat more carbs. But for people of European descent, there's no effect on carb intake on Alzheimer's disease risk. Well, if there's also a genotypic, a mean gene level difference between the African descent and European descent individuals, such that, say in this case, African, indi African descent individuals have more E4, then this will lead to a apparent G by E interaction, right? This isn't necessarily the, the one that it would look like, but it will be in this direction, such that it's going to look like E4 is increased, the risk of E4 depends on, or is increasing with carbon take and that of E3 less so. And why is that? That's because um, you know, E4 here 
is actually a weak proxy for being African American, or uh, I'm sorry, African descent, right? Because there's a mean difference in the level of E4 between African and Europeans. So if you see that you're E4, it also makes it slightly more likely that you're of African descent. And we know that people of African descent are more susceptible to Alzheimer's disease as a function of carb intake. And so the apparent G by E that you see is really due to the covariate by E interaction. And that's going to be properly controlled. And the same thing happens in the, in the other case. So um, issues with uh, candidate gene by environment interaction findings. Um, so candidate gene um, studies relate uh, you know, a trait to one or a small number of genetic polymorphisms. So the candidate gene is actually a misnomer. It's actually more candidate. It's, it's polymorphisms, guessed at polymorphisms within guessed at genes. So there's two levels of guessing that have to go into getting this right. Um, historically, those are based on, on theory about the underlying biology that affects some trait. And that since then took a life of its own. So a lot of these started off with one particular theory about how, they, how these uh, monoamines, serotonin, uh, for example, or dopamine might affect a, a given trait. And then it, those same genes, there are about 30 or 35 of these genes, just get kind of trotted out for every trait under the sun. Um, and uh, despite uh, the, the vast majority of reports in the literature, if you look, are actually positive. You see, this, you see the effect of these candidate gene polymorphisms. Um, almost none of those have been supported by very large, well-powered GWASs. Um, and these things are still being done. So this is a, a plot by a paper that we've just put out by Richard Border that shows the cumulative number of, of, uh, of candidate gene studies. And this is, in, this is in the whole genome era. This is when people should be realizing that, look, something's really amiss. The effect sizes that we're reporting in these candidate gene studies are orders of magnitude bigger than what we ever see in GWAS. Um, nevertheless, it's, it's still on upward trajectory. And this is the cumulative total in the, in the black. And this is just for major depression. This is major depression alone. Um, over 1,200 papers published. Uh, there's probably tens of thousands of these overall. Um, so we've worried about the, the we've talked about the, um, the possibility that, at least for G by E, that there's a very high false positive rate. Um, almost all the novel G by E studies that are found, that are published, are positive. They show, they sh they show the interaction. 96 percent. Yeah. So we did a review and uh, looked at 120 published G by E candidate gene by E papers, and all but one, uh, or however many it was, yeah, 115. I don't remember. All but one were um, showed a sig. Uh, all, no, no, no. I mean, what does that make? All but five, I think, showed whatever it is. 96 <laughs> percent. Jesus, my math's not good. Um, showed a <laughs> showed a significant um, G by E effect. It's going to be a couple of things, and I think your publication bias is one. I think uh, that it would be hard to explain by publication bias alone. Uh, I think it's also likely that there's a lot of fishing going on. And um, so we've, um, let me just skip. So these are the different ways that, that this could happen. We call it improper multiple testing correction. That I think another way of saying that is p-hacking or phishing. Um, what's that? Related to publication bias. Yeah. Well, not really. I mean, pu publication bias is about what, you know, what, what is accepted for publication, but it doesn't say what happens before they even the paper gets written up. I mean, if people are looking at 30 different candidate polymorphisms and only say that they reported one, you, you know, they only looked at one, you could call that improper multiple testing correction. You could also call it p-hacking. I think both terms are, are used. Yeah. This, so this is a paper we, that, that we just published, and I don't know, this feels a little bit like kicking a dead horse, but it's gotten a lot of, of attention. Um, but we, uh, we did this in, in very large samples, multiple large samples, including the UKB and the PGC, and we imputed the, the repeat polymorphisms. So that is possible to impute these repeat polymorphisms. It's not done very often, but we put that up on UKB. So if you guys want access to those most, most studied candidate genes, because a lot of them are repeats, um, that's free to the, the public now, at least the UKB. And this is just with respect to estimated lifetime depression. We actually looked at um, 640 different tests. Um, we used an exceedingly liberal uh, correction for this. We only divided alpha by um, the number of different depression phenotypes we looked at, which was 16. And so we expected that there would be uh, several of these that were significant. We found one out of 640 tests that were significant. 
Um, and this is despite having 99.9% .9 power to detect everything that had been detected before as reported in the literature. Um, I think this, this uh, to me, this is, uh, it wasn't super surprising, but it, it's fascinating sociologically that, that the scientific community has allowed this to happen. I think it's actually frightening that we've uh, built entire edifices in the sky um, based on nothing. Um, but this is uh, for three different types of hypotheses. Um, the main effect for 5-HTTLPR on depression, and then the uh, two different types of interaction effects, one based on childhood trauma, um, one on adult trauma. And um, across the 16 most studied candidate genes, um, there's not a whiff of evidence that any of this is true. These are pretty tight ranges. This is the a level of 80% power at n equal 1,000. So most of the candidate gene studies that have been published have effect sizes way up here somewhere. And we're, seeing, we're showing that that almost certainly cannot be the case. Um, we also uh, recently rebutted an argument that people were saying, well, this is because of measurement error. Uh, you can model that and show that there's, it's impossible for that actually to account for this. Even with 90% uh, measurement error in our measures, which is unrealistic, uh, we still had uh, over 90% power to detect these. We don't detect any of them. Okay, so um, I think I'm probably nearly out of time. So, um, okay, so um, talk about genome-wide by interaction studies. So, so just in brief, you know, I, I am interested in interactions. Uh, I think that they probably do exist. I think they're hard to find. So, what would I recommend doing? Um, you know, we live in a day and age where, um, you know, doing a candidate gene study costs uh, probably about as much or more than just doing this whole genome. So that actually makes no sense not to look at this across the genome. So why not do a genome-wide interaction study? Um, so first suggestion is don't use historical candidates and could conduct a hypothesis-free genome, GWIS. The typical threshold I've seen in the literature for this continues to be 5 e negative 8. I think that's probably correct, but I, don't, I haven't seen any justification um, for it. So uh, that's, I guess, something that somebody could, could look at as what, what, is a, what is a true type 1 error rate when you use that in an interaction. I think it's probably going to be that or close to it. There's also been some papers that argue for a two-stage because interactions typically have less power than main effects to detect, that we should not kneecap ourselves in power and by the genome-wide corrections so that what we should do is a two-stage analysis where we first choose all a priori candidates and um, we're not talking about the, the usual candidate gene, usual suspect candidate genes. We're talking about something based on empirical evidence. So this could be based on main effects because it's very unlikely for an interaction uh, not to have any main effect. The only time that happens is, is if you have a perfect crossover with equal levels in, 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 uh, the, in the risk factor of G. So almost all cases you will see some main effect. So we could condition this on the biggest main effects or on variants that show some evidence of heterogeneity, some, and then um, use a lower p-value, uh, a, a lower alpha correction for just those hundreds of variants, and then for the rest of the genome, we would look at all of them. I think if you decide to do this, it's crucial that you um, pre-register your analyses and, ex and explain exactly how you, you plan to do this going in before you start looking at the data. And I, I'm saying that not only to, to re you know, reduce the false positive problem, but also because I think it's going to be hard to publish unless you do that. And so we are currently conducting a GWAS ourselves for APOE and another one for, um, for Mr. Big. The, 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 um, well, we're doing both of these genome-wide, um, but we have pre-registered that we exp we're going to um, not do the full genome-wide correction for those variants because um, you know, we have a priori evidence to think these are big main effects and therefore there might be some interactive effect with those. Um, I think it's important that you report results from both the additive and multiplicative models, um, you know, and let the readers take that as it will. I think if you see it's significant for one scale and not for the other, I think that could help in interpreting what's, what's happening in, the, in, the, in that effect. Um, you know, center the variables, both G and E, or if you don't do that, at least describe what the zero points are so that the main effects or the simple effects can be interpretable. Um, if you're going to do this using the, rather than stratifying, using the, the uh, just all in one model, you need to make sure that you include the G by E, I'm sorry, the C by G and the C by E interaction effects. And um, power is lower, as I said, for interactions, so you've got to ch choose N accordings, so try to have large 
um, sample sizes. So the final thing I'll go through is just uh, polygenic risk score by e-analysis. Um, so the typical way you do this is we, dis we derive the weights in an independent discovery sample. Um, we build a PGS from uh, those in, uh, in a target sample that's independent of the discovery. And we test the interaction um, using the polygenic score. So um, there's the main effect for the polygenic score. There's the polygenic score by E interaction, the product term and the, the effect. And then here's all the covariate uh, interaction terms. Um, in principle, the, this would test the quantitative interaction, whether the heritability or the SNP heritability, or in this case, the polygenic score heritability increases as a function of E. Um, but in practice, uh, we're, we're, I'm working on this with uh, someone named Vauder Perut. Oh, I said I don't even know his last, how to say his last name. I just call him Vauder. So um, in, in practice, it's, it, we really can't distinguish between qualitative and quantitative interactions using a, a PGS. Um, so even if the qualitative interact, if the qualitative interaction exists, any mean differences in E between the discovery and target sample lead to apparent um, polygenic score by E interactions. And that's uh, demonstrated here. We, we simulated just a pure qualitative G by E, such that the effects of the genes um, differ depending on whether you had childhood trauma or you had no childhood trauma. So the genetic correlation between these is low, but the absolute heritability for these two groups was the same. And we conducted a polygenic score um, by E interaction. And what we see is that the polygenic score is, um, we, we see the interaction, right? The, that, that for individuals with no childhood trauma, there's this increase in heritability as a function of E, um, but that doesn't occur uh, with, uh, when, for people who have childhood trauma. And this is probably because the original um, discovery sample was um, included mostly people with no childhood trauma, this is 80% of the sample, and so the, the polygenic score is going to do a much better job of predicting um, depression or whatever the outcome is than um, those with, without. So, so, and we also, by the way, did it with when we simulated the quantitative interactions. So the heritability was higher, the CT1 than CT0, and we, we showed that that is actually what you see. Um, Vauder has published a couple of papers on this. So he found a, a significant PGS by E interaction for major depression, such that the heritability uh, was for major depression was higher for people with childhood trauma. It's published in 2014, uh, and then it didn't replicate. And I, I think this is, uh, it's a, uh, you know, this honorable thing to do is to try to replicate your own results. And if they don't replicate, try to get that published too. Um, and it's not completely clear why this didn't replicate, and that kind of spurred his interest in trying to understand this PGS by E interaction issue. We're still working on it. Um, Vauder's there at the Broad working with Alki's Price, and um, I don't know if this will, it's kind of stalled in the meantime since, but maybe he'll get, he'll circle back to it. Um, so anyway, this is the summary. I think uh, it's, it's pretty redundant with things, so happy to take any questions.